Good morning. So glad you're here. If you wouldn't mind standing with me a moment, I'm going to read to you from John chapter 6. I'm just going to read a couple of verses because it's kind of a long message that Jesus gave in a synagogue. John 6, 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Let's stop there and pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have come to give us life, that you didn't come to condemn the world, but through the love of you, the mercy of you, the grace of you, that we might have eternal life. Speak to us now from your word. Send your Holy Spirit to help us grow in you. Do these things we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. So three women were in a terrible car accident, all died together and went to heaven. And of course, when they got to the pearly gates, there was St. Peter. Peter said, there's only one rule in heaven. There are a lot of ducks here. Don't step on a duck. They went, looked at each other, went, okay. So the first day they walked in, and sure enough, there's a lot of ducks everywhere. And the first lady accidentally stepped on a duck. And she went, oh, no. Peter showed up with the ugliest man she had ever seen, chained. And she stood there as Peter walked over and chained her to the ugliest guy for all of eternity. Oh, no. The other two watched this with huge eyes. And so they were really careful not to step on the ducks. But of course, the next day, the second girl stepped on a duck. Peter showed up, same deal. Second ugliest guy in the whole world, in chains, chained her to him for the rest of eternity. Third one went, oh my goodness, I'm not stepping on any ducks. And so for months, she was really careful going through heaven. And finally, Peter walked up with the most handsome man she'd ever seen in her life. And she was absolutely stunned by him. And Peter chained him to her and walked off without saying a word. And she said, I I don't know what happened. I didn't step on anything. He said, I don't know about you, but I stepped on a duck. I'm Pastor Greg, just write those cards and letters. (laughs) Okay, well, we have in the English language this phrase, that's better than sliced bread. Jesus said here, he is the bread of life. What's he trying to get to? Well, bread in these United States was always like the rest of the world, baked in a single loaf until 1906. And then uh, a man came up with a, uh, who was tired of burnt toast, evidently, with a toaster. And it was kind of plain looking. They'd only do one side at a time. And when you had to turn it over, you had to unplug it. Didn't even have an off and on switch. And they sold a few, but most people were afraid of toasters or appliances that only had one use. And uh, so 10 years later, he came out with an automatic toaster that would do both sides of the toast. And it sold a few more units, but it really didn't catch on until a company, a baking company in Indianapolis called Taggart Baking Company, introduced a startling new idea, pre-sliced bread. And it was so amazing, they called it Wonder Bread. (laughs) True, true story. Okay, so the next year, The guy sold 1.2 million toasters. The world was waiting for automatic toasters and Wonder Bread, evidently. Pre-sliced bread, about the coolest thing, and that brought about this saying, that's better than sliced bread. Greater than anything, hmm, nourishment for hungry souls. Jesus is the only real soul food. 
He is food for our soul is what he's talking about in this sermon, really. We're looking at kind of a long sermon, and uh, it's about the subject of bread. Now, bread, the term is used now today to mean just sitting and sharing a meal. We're going to break bread together. So bread was the substance of life in those days. And actually in much of the world today, you go to the Middle East, go to Africa, uh, go to Eastern Europe, uh, bread, fresh bread every morning is sold on hand carts and delivered to people's houses. So Jesus is trying to touch on that concept that there is only one thing you can eat that will change your eternal destiny. Now, remember this setting is, if you were with us two weeks ago, It was shortly after the feeding of 5,000 men and then women and children on top of that. And they were in the area above the Sea of Galilee overlooking it in Bethesda. And there they uh, made everyone hungry. They talked so long. Jesus lectured all day long, taught. And at the end, everyone was hungry and Jesus turned to his disciples. How will we feed them? And uh, they said, well, we don't have enough money. And uh, Jesus said, what do you have? And they said, well, (laughs) a kid got two fish and five little tiny loaves. But what's that among so many? And Jesus said, bring it to me. He blessed it. And then did the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And the result was the people in that day thought of the king as one who would come and give them free bread because that's what was happening in Rome. In the city of Rome, Caesar gave a loaf of bread to every family every morning and the tickets for the circus, entertainment, the gladiators fighting. So that was their concept of the king. They wanted Jesus to be king. They wanted him to be the bread king. (laughs) They wanted him to take care of all their eating needs. So this particular section was actually taught in a synagogue, the synagogue of Capernaum. And uh, it is a place you can visit today. Actually, the team just got back last week, and that's what they saw. That is the reconstructed uh, synagogue in Capernaum without the roof on it yet. If you look on the steps there, second step up, there's a black basalt stone that goes, uh, flooring that goes all the way along it. That is actually the, century, the first century synagogue flooring that Jesus was standing on when he gave this sermon. You can go and visit. Here's the artist's conception of what it looked like with the roof on it. So he wasn't trying to draw a large crowd. He's in a small building. The number of people were in the thousands whom he fed. He's trying to not get more people. He's trying to get committed disciples. He's not looking for the most populated, largest gathering. He's looking for people who will surrender their lives to him. Let him be Lord, master, ruler of their lives. So you have to kind of put your thinking cap on here because he is talking about eternal life. And he uses some things that we would get caught up in the physical, material world And he's trying to drag them from the physical world into the spiritual world. This section has uh, three parts to it. The bread of life, he says in verse 35. He says says it all over again in 48 and gives a different illustration for it. And then the last section, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. So that's where we're going. Here we go. Verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. The unbelieving crowd makes it necessary for Jesus to be very plain that he was talking about himself, but not in a material sense. This is the first of seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. Jesus said here, I am the bread of life the sustenance of life. Then in 8, he, sa- he will say, I am the light. 
and then in 10, I am the door. And then at the latter part, I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, I am the resurrection and life. 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 15, 1, I am the true vine. Now, most of us have heard these phrases, but have probably missed the importance of the ego emi, the first part, I am. Now, that was a claim to deity, and they all knew it, that we're listening. In other words, when Moses was at the burning bush, you'll remember in Exodus, he said to the burning bush, it was the first Bush administration, and he said, see, some of you are starting to fade off already. I can see, you know, just trying to come on back. At that bush, who am I going to tell Pharaoh, send me? And Jesus in the bush said, I am. I am what? I am anything you need. I am your good shepherd. I am your life. I am your bread of life. I am the redeemer of your soul. I am the one who heals you. I am the one whom you need for eternity. So he, he says, he who believes in me, he equates himself with bread. He is essential is what he's saying. Secondly, the life Jesus is referring to is not physical, but spiritual. And thirdly, he's making this claim, I'm God. And they're riveted by it. Verse 36, but I say to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. You've seen me doing miracles. You've watched the bread. Well, you also watched a, a man 38 years by the pool in Jerusalem and I said, take up your bread and walk, and he did. So you've seen me doing astounding miracles. A little boy that was dying down in Capernaum, and he sent his father back and said, go, your son is healed, and he was. He turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. So they had seen all these things, yet they did not believe. Believe what? They didn't believe he was God, the Messiah, who had come to earth to die for their sins. That's what's going on here. Oh, they believed he was a great magician or maybe even a, a great miracle worker. They didn't believe he was God. They were excited about the sideshow. They wanted the entertainment. Do us another one. But they didn't believe he could save them for eternity by them surrendering their lives to him. Whoa, wait a minute, Pastor. You're getting pretty serious here now. He's serious. He wants committed disciples who will surrender their life. Well, I have free will. I get to do what I want. You do. But one of the things you get to do is to choose him. Choose life. Choose eternal life. That's where this is going. You see me, but you haven't believed. All that the Father gives me people, all the people that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. You come to Jesus when you are desperate. Most of us come without exactly pure motives. Your know, life's a mess. I'm stumbling. I'm in trouble financially. I, I'm in trouble with the law. I'm in trouble with my relationship. I'm in trouble at work. Something and we cry out to God. Our motives sometimes are not perfect. In fact, I would say none of us come with perfect motives. We just come as we are, just as I am. I come to thee without one plea, without one excuse. I just need you, God. It's a very humbling thing to do and say, but it will bring a change of eternity. The one who comes to me, the consequences of the gift is he will not reject any person. Well, well, Pastor, you don't know how bad I am. I probably don't, but I know how bad I was. I know how lost I am. Some of you, I know how bad you were. Goodness gracious. <laughs> but he takes anyone, anyone who will humble themselves, come to me. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven. 
Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, the Father's will. I'm doing what God the Father wants me to do. I was at the car dealer down the street last week, and, and a guy walks up to me. I, he he kind of looked familiar, but I didn't know him, really. And he said, uh, I know who you are. I said, uh-oh. Um, and he said, I want to know if Jesus always did the Father's will. Uh, that's a very strange question to be asking me in a car dealer when, in fact, I'm going to have to speak on it this week. And I quoted this verse to him. I, do, I came to do the will of God the Father. He said, well, what about at the Garden of Gethsemane? He was weeping and he said that he, he didn't want this cup. He wanted it to pass. I said, well, I have the same problem. God shows me a lot of things that he wants me to do, and I go, oh, can we do it a different way? You know, isn't there an easier way than a, a car accident that crushes <laughs> your bones and your head and your face and everything? Couldn't we just do it with a nice game of um, tennis or something? <laughs> no, no, I have something else in mind. Ah, uh, this is the will of the Father who sent me, verse 39 that of all he has given me, that would be you, that would be me, all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Raise it up, your body and mine. Only we get a new one. This one's wearing out. It's got a lot of stainless steel in it. Now it's just not going to hold up. <laughs> it's not like the original model. And it aches and, you know, it's got new places to complain about. But there's a new one coming. And suddenly, at the sound of a trumpet, in the twinkling of an eye, you and I will suddenly be caught up in the air with Jesus. That's what Thessalonians says. Every person will, in fact, one day be resurrected. Those that are evil and those who are surrendered to him to different destinations, yes. But it will happen to all of us. What a fantastic story. You don't really believe that, do you, Pastor? Absolutely, I believe it. Convinced that all of us will someday rise again. That's what he's talking about. That we should rise up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, Father God that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him. 58 times John is going to use the word believe, faith, and trust, all the same word, pistos, in the Greek language. It is the critical step, believing what he said is true. Well, that's hard. You know, that was 2,000 years ago. And I need to see stuff. Listen, they had him there doing miracles, raising dead people, and it wasn't enough. They still had to choose to believe. I choose to believe, and then comes understanding. You say, God, I don't understand exactly how this works, but forgive my sins, take my life. And he says, that's what I've been waiting for. And then you begin to understand that he comes into your life. He's going to talk about that. That he is actually going to take up residence in you. Christ in you. Christ in me. The hope of eternal life. Of glory. Him living inside of you. Living inside of me. Raise him up on the last day. Verse 41. The Jews complained about him. The word is murmur. They've been murmuring about him since the 14th century B.C. when they were on the Exodus. He's, because he said, I am the bread which comes down from heaven. The children of Israel were in the desert for 40 years and they murmured the whole time and nothing's changed. I am the bread that come down from heaven. He claimed to be from eternity, from heaven. Always existence. He always was. He is now and he always will be. Verse 42, and they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? The answer to that question is no, it is not. He is not the son of Joseph. He is Jesus, the son of God. God himself came to earth. Yes, Joseph was his stepfather, and he grew up in an area very close to Capernaum, where he's speaking. It's only about six miles up the road to Nazareth. 
And he said, uh, we know his father and his mother. No, no, you think you know in the flesh, in the material world. You think you know things. How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? How is it? He's not a local kid. He may have grown up in an area that you're familiar with. You saw this, this little kid, but you didn't realize he was God. Jesus therefore answered, verse 43, and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. He's trying to reach these people. He's working at it. No one can come to me, he said, unless the Father draws. He's trying to draw you right now. Don't resist. Maybe some of you are in that condition right now. Somebody drug you to church this morning. And she's sitting beside you. (laughs) And you're going, oh my goodness, it's Memorial Day. And I could be barbecuing. (laughs) And here I am, stuck in this church. Listen. You can listen with a critical ear and miss it completely. I know, I did it for years. You can listen with a jaundiced eye and say, who is that guy anyway? And miss the entire point. Because it's not about who I am, it's about who he is. And that's the point he's trying to make. Don't murmur among yourselves, is this guy ever gonna stop? Don't be murmuring. It is written in the prophets, and then he quotes Isaiah 54 here, where it says, they shall all be taught by God. It's happening right now. You, know, you might be resisting. You may not have a teachable spirit. You may be saying, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Nah, 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 nah. That's the way I went to church for a long time. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you are being taught by God. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. Just me reading it to you eloquently or not, stumbling or falling down, when you hear God's word being taught, faith invades your heart. That's his promise. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. That's why we study God's word here. 46. Do not, excuse me, not that anyone has seen the Father. It's not that you can see him, except that he who is from God, has seen him. Who said that? Jesus, right. He said, I came down from heaven, and he's going to flame him out again. He's claiming to have come from heaven. He sees Father God and survives. No human being in the flesh can see him. And you go, well, what about Isaiah? In Isaiah chapter 6, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. No, no, he saw a picture of who God was. He didn't see him face to face. Moses saw the backside of Jesus as he walked past in the cave. John himself, the writer of this, will go to heaven in the book of Revelation, and he'll see the Lord on an emerald throne with a green rainbow over his top. Was that him? It was just a picture that John could handle. Nobody has seen him face to face because when you see him face to face, you'll be dead. What? No man can see God and live. But when you die, take your last breath here, your next breath, Jesus will be looking you in the face. Is that a wow or what? Suddenly, you can see God. And you will be changed. You will know as you are now known, is the way the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians. You will know. All of a sudden you'll understand. Nobody's going to run around and say, who are you? You look familiar in heaven. Can I see your tag? Nobody's wearing tags that say Moses or Abraham or whatever. You'll know. Finally, this thing will work up here the way it was designed. Seeing him, we will be like him. Verse 47, most assuredly I say to you, truly, truly I say to you, he who believes, trusts in, clings to, relies on me, has everlasting life. That's it. You get it by believing that he died for your sins. You confess it with your mouth and you believe it in your heart. Second bread of life section. That's the first section. We got to... Some of you are getting hungry. I can see that look on your face. 
we're talking about bread here. Really, is it warm, Pastor? Verse 48. I am the bread of life. This is a cool verse. Simple, eloquent, 48. I am the nourishment that your soul needs. That's what Jesus said. Honest to goodness soul food. He's the real deal. Satisfying nutrition. The provision of God for humanity. Eternal life-giving food. That's whom Jesus is. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. You remember they're in the Exodus. They're going across the Sinai. It's like 29 palms. And, uh, and they're, first they're thirsty, so God gives them water out of a rock. And then they complain because they, they need fresh bread. They're used to, fr- they make bread, but they're moving all the time, so they can't bake bread can't get the yeast to rise up, etc. And so they complain, murmur again. And Moses says, God's going to send down something for you to eat. Next morning they get up, the ground's covered with this white, like hoary frost looking thing. And they, uh, and they walked out and they looked around and they say, manna. Why did they say manna? Because in Hebrew it means, what is it? Or we would say today, what up? My grandson. He leaves words out. I don't know. He grew up in America. Definite articles are not important to him. What up? Really? Is that a sentence? But that's what manna means. They said, what is this? It's your bread. And they gathered it up. Six days a week it came and they could bake it. They could make manna pancakes, manna cotti. They had so many manna possibilities, manna tacos, manna enchiladas. Yeah. So that manna they ate, but it didn't give them eternal life. That's where he's going with this. This bread, which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. Me is what Jesus is saying. Eating Jesus, the bread of life, is another expression of believing on him. What he said is true. 51, I am the bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, and I shall give it for the life of the world. His flesh? Yes, he's going to die on a cross. His life is going to run down that cross in the form of his blood. And the life is in the blood. We know that to be a, in fact, medical reality, that blood contains all the necessary ingredients for your life. Without, but we have not been able to make artificial blood. We have tried to out of fluorocarbons and other things. It doesn't last. It deteriorates the veins and the arteries. Only real living blood produced by your own bone marrow will keep you alive. Carry blood, carry oxygen to the tissues and bring back carbon dioxide and the products of metabolism, and we won't do a lecture here. Verse 52, the Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? He's talking spiritually, but just like Nicodemus, the chief priest, when uh, he came to Jesus and Jesus, he said, well, what do I have to do? And Jesus said, you must be born again. And he goes right to physical birth. My mom is old. She's not going to appreciate this. No, 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 Nicodemus. You must be born of water and of the spirit. You need a spiritual birth. The woman at the well did the same thing. You remember the Samaritan woman? She comes up and Jesus is sitting by the well and and, uh, he said, please give me water. And and she uh, says, you have nothing to get it with. And he said, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for water and I would give you living water. And she said, you know, I'd like that living water. I would have to come here in the hot of the day. You know, it's a long hike up this hill to this well. She's thinking physically, materially. And he's trying to communicate 
one of the greatest spiritual truths of all time. That you drink of Jesus and your thirst for things of the world that we think will satisfy. You know, some power trip, some financial trip, some educational trip. How many letters can you get after your name? Some position in the world that you think will satisfy, that you are lusting for. And, and I, I talk to people all the time with addictions to gambling and, and sex and, and different kinds of drugs and alcohol. None of those things quench your thirst. There's only one, and it's Jesus but you must keep going back to him over and over again. I must continue to go back to him and say, Lord, be Lord today. I surrender. I give you control. So Jesus said to them, most assuredly, verse 53, I said to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, what? And drink his blood. Are we talking cannibalism here? No, no, no. You're thinking material. You're thinking physical. He's talking about taking something. Okay, this is cool if you're a, a chemist or a biologist. Okay, up until this time, he used the Greek word for eating is phago or phago. And it means to sit down and eat a meal. But from here on down, 54 on down, he uses a different Greek word. And it is trogo, T-R-O-G-O. Trogocytosis. Trogocytosis is a biological law. It's what happens. It's happening in you right now. Okay. Sorry, we're going to deteriorate into chemistry in just a moment. But it's important because it's cool when you see what why Jesus changes the word. So you have a way to fight foreign proteins. God built you that way. It's an elegant, elegant piece of equipment. It's in your bone marrows. And your bone marrow has these cells, these white blood cells, these T cells that will go out and identify, identify foreign invaders and take them in, and this is that word eat, trogo them in, take the important parts off, take it in, and then express, important word, express it then in an antibody that goes out and attacks, attacks the real thing. Okay, uh, this used to be a touchy subject. I think we can talk about it a little bit. Okay, so today we have COVID. <laughs> Maybe you didn't notice. Uh, but the guy at Austin State University that identified the spikes on the coronavirus that we call COVID today uh, did so by doing a very clever experiment. He had a million dollar scanning electron microscope and a million dollar Cray computer. And he hooked the two together, the first guy in the world to do this, and he took the little, he identified the cell that's, that causes COVID, the virus, okay, and he put it in a, a hypertonic solution first, and then he put it in a hypotonic solution, so it made the little virus swell and then and finally burst open. And then he used this scanning electron microscope in this amazing computer to take pictures of the exploded virus cell all over on this wet slide. Bear with me, it'll make sense in a moment. And then the piece that causes the infection, the spike, the corona, it's called a corona because it's got little spikes sticking out of it. The corona he identified, put it in a cell, the cell trogocytosis, this word, this Greek word, that Jesus used 2,000 years ago. Science didn't know about trogocytosis. The white blood cell, the T cell, identifies the spike program, takes the genetic code, reproduces it in its own mitochondria, and kicks out an antibody that is a perfect fit into the COVID virus and strangles it to death. That is the word that Jesus used. How did he know that? <laughs> the creator of the universe? How did he know to use the word togo? 
because it was eating, taking the, character, the important characteristic in, and then expressing it. You eat Jesus. I eat Jesus. I take him in. And my life begins to express the characteristics of Jesus. You start acting like Jesus. You start thinking like him. You care for people that are struggling. You have mercy. You have humility. Oh, you may fight against it. I do all the time. But Jesus is, wants us to togo him, take him in, and allow him to invade our lives and we'll start expressing his life to others. Now, I don't know if that worked for you, but I just get excited about biochemistry. So, you know, you can tell I'm excited about it. I don't know about him. Okay, whoever togos my flesh, takes it in, and then expresses it out, and drinks my blood, really, drink, yes, has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. You will rise at the trumpet sound. The disciples are going, what? Now, some have tried to apply this to communion. Communion is not going to happen for chapters here. It's important. Something happens when we submit ourselves to the bread and the grape juice. Some of you did this morning. But this is not referring to communion. This is referring to surrender your life, and he invades your life. And you take him in, you study his word as you are doing right now. For my flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed, real nourishment for your soul, verse 56. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, abides in me, stays connected to me, and I am him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. He is life. I am life. He who feeds on me, again, togos, takes me in and expresses my life, will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your father ate the manna, they're dead. Really, Jesus, be a little softer here. He who eats the bread will live forever. Slowly, constantly extracting his life will cause you to live forever. 59, these things he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. That little... When you're there and you go up the steps, now you all need to go to Israel if you haven't been, and you go up that second step, step off into the left and stand on that stone, that black stone there, because that's where Jesus stood. That's the steps going into the synagogue. And you can say, well, I walked where Jesus walked. It'll change you. It'll change your life. Okay, so that's the synagogue where he said these things, verse 59, verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, and the word here is not apostles, not the twelve, Disciples, he, he probably had hundreds of them, maybe more at this time. When they heard this, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Because they can't fit it in physically. It's a spiritual truth. It's not a material world thing. You can't understand with your, your Swiss army knife of things that you've done in your life. This is something that is the source of eternal life. Jesus knew in himself that his disciples were complaining about this. He said, does this offend you? And uh, <laughs> this disrupt your way of thinking? Yeah, it does. What then, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? What if you're standing on the, which they would do, stand on the Mount of Olives, and he would rise up to heaven and disappear in the clouds? If this is blowing your mind, just keep an eye on me. That's what he's saying. You will be wowed. It is the spirit who gives life. No, uh, excuse me, gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. They are life. And th this word is rhema. It, it's not logos. It's not the written word, although that's important. Faith comes by hearing the written word. But the rhema is the word that touches you right now where you're living. It's a live, active word. I'm trying to give you rhema and not just give you logos, okay? I, I, I'm not a preacher, I'm a teacher, but I also know that Jesus gives us words and illustrations and explanations that are, are just especially for you and whatever thing your life is about. Words 
that I speak are life. Verse uh, 64, we're hurrying here. But there are among some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. He's talking about Judas. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted by the Father. That, that, he keeps reiterating that because he wants you to know. He, he wants me to remember couple of verses first peter 3 9 the lord is not willing that any person should perish but that all should come to repentance that is god's desire for every person in every country speaking every kind of language the back the back country of australia aborigines to people in siberia to uh, central africa it doesn't matter what tribe, what color of skin you have, what language you speak, where you were born. He would that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. First Timothy 2, 4. Who wants all men to be saved. That's God's desire. And will come to the knowledge of truth. People, many people resist it. I would dare say most people are resisting it. But his desire is that they would come. Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That, that's you saying, Jesus, I need you. And he hears, and you will be saved. Behold, I stand at the knock, at, at door knock, Revelation 3.20. And if anyone opens the door, anytime, anywhere, opens the door of your heart and say, Jesus, come in. Desperate. You're about ready to fall. You're falling off the, fa the north face of Yosemite. You go, Jesus, you will wake up looking at him. <laughs> He'll answer that prayer. Last section. Sixty I told you it was long. From that time, many of his disciples w went back and walked with him no more. It was too hard, too difficult. Why? They didn't want to let God have control. We're all control freaks. Oh, God. I want to run my own life because I'm doing such a great job. Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? These other people are leaving. Simon Peter, love Simon, big burly fisherman said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the only person that can lead us into eternity. Where else could we possibly go? To some palm reader? To some fortune teller? No, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Messiah. You are the King, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered, did I not choose you, the twelve? But one of you is the devil, speaking of Judas, verse 71, Escarot, the son of Simon. For it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. There was an ancient father of the church in 381 in the Cappadocian Valley. Some of you that went on footsteps of Paul with this went into central Turkey and there's these fairy castles that are made out of sandstone. It's just a beautiful spot. And, uh, and he was a pastor there. And in 381 he wrote these words. Jesus began life on earth as a hungry baby, yet he is the bread of life. He ended his life on earth thirsty, yet he is the living water. Jesus was weary, yet he is our rest. Jesus paid taxes, yet he is the king. He was accused of having a demon, yet he cast out demons. He wept, yet he can wipe away your tears. He, he was sold for 30 pieces of silver, Yet he redeemed the entire world. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Yet he is the good shepherd. Jesus died. Yet by his death he destroyed the power of death. Let me close with this. Back in 1928, this man, uh, Sadhu Sindar Singh, was uh, a missionary in India, central India. And he had this idea how to reach the masses, the billion people of India. 
by giving them this word, this gospel of John. And so he personally paid the money to have the gospel of John printed uh, in Hindi and on tissue paper, very light paper. And he would walk throughout central India giving these gospel of John's away. He got on a train. The train was headed to Calcutta, and uh, he started passing out these Gospels of John, very thin, very light, and he handed it to one man who looked at it and got very angry. And he exploded in anger, and, and he tore up this Gospel of John into little tiny pieces, as small as he could make them, then he threw them out the window. And Sadat thought it was the last time he'd hear about it. But unbeknownst to him, a traveler was walking along the railroad tracks on the side, and a little piece of paper fluttered down in front of him. And he opened it up, and in his language were only four words, the bread of life. He thought, what a fantastic concept. I, I don't know what this means. He began to ask people, and someone finally said, Oh, it's from a Christian book, but you don't dare read it because it'll defile you. But just the words drew him. And so he finally went to a church and asked where these words were found. And they gave him a gospel of John. The exact same one. Same tissue paper version of the gospel of John. And he found it. They helped him find it. Verse 35 that we started with. And he needed to understand the context, and they explained it to him, and, and he asked how he could study this book. And he had a, a little Bible college there, and he went through the Bible college, and he fell in love with God. And because of this tiny scrap of paper that said these four words, the bread of life, he became a pastor, he became a preacher, and he walked all over India distributing tens of thousands of copies of this gospel. He changed the direction of India. Many people accredit him with turning the Hindu nation to Christianity. Go and do likewise. Would you stand please and we'll pray together. Lord, we thank you that only eternity will, will reveal how many lives are changed by our witness. We thank you that you have called us to represent you in the world. Uh, give us the courage to do that and the courage to believe on you if someone here has not done that. Christians, please pray. So I wonder if there's someone here this morning, either in the building or out on the radio or the internet, that you're struggling with letting God have control of your life and you haven't asked him to forgive your sins or maybe you did in the past and and now moved on to other things, and it's not working. This moment is for you. We wouldn't do anything to embarrass you, but if you would like to know that your sins are forgiven, if you would like to know that you are going to spend eternity with God, if you're ready to surrender your life to God, would you let me know you're ready by looking up at me and raising your hand? I won't embarrass you. I'll just acknowledge it. Anybody here that God is speaking to about surrendering? Yes, God bless you on the aisle. And you, sir, yes, young lady, right in front of me, behind you, a couple, God bless you. Anyone over here God is speaking to? Yes, sir. Anyone over here God is speaking to? If I miss your hand, don't worry, God did not. Those of you that raised your hands, would you please talk to God with us? We're just going to ask him out loud. We'll do it together, make it easy, to forgive our sins and take our lives, and he will do it right where you are. Everybody, please say, Lord Jesus... I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.